Welcome to Hope Online. Hi, I'm Gerald. I'm one of the pastors here at Hope, and I am so glad that we get to worship together today. If you have kids at home, I just want you to keep this in mind that we do have services that are designed specifically for them. You can find those services for kids and all of our other weekly opportunities on our church website at hopepd.org. Now, I want to ask you to do a quick favor for me. I want you to click the subscribe button right down here. I want you to click subscribe and leave a comment because if you do, you'll help us be able to reach a lot more people. Now, let's pray together as we get ready to get started for worship. Gracious God, thank you for this incredible day. Thank you for the gift of life. And even though our worlds are different than we would want them to be, we are thankful that we get to worship you together today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, whether you're watching at home, in your car, maybe out for a walk, or even on the golf course, let's get our worship started with this first song. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never. Well, welcome to Hope. Have you ever noticed that in so many areas of our life we can believe without hesitation? Yet when it comes to faith, we're reluctant to jump in unless all of our questions are answered. I mean, I've talked to people that have said things to me like, I can't follow Jesus because I can't believe that if there is such a loving God, why did my spouse leave me? Or why did I lose my job? Or why did I get cancer? Have you ever gone through something tough in your life and it left you doubting your faith? Wondering if all this Jesus stuff is actually real? Well, for being honest, all of us have. I know I have. 
Andy Stanley, who is one of my favorite speakers and is a master at summarizing a message into one simple sentence. He was speaking about faith and he said this, you don't have to understand everything to believe in something. I thought that was brilliant because there are so many things that we don't understand, yet we believe. Even though they are unexplainable, they can be undeniable, allowing us to believe. Now let me give you an example of this. If you like baseball, you're going to love this analogy. Watch this video. Yogi Berra said you can't think and hit at the same time. And if we're talking about hitting a major league fastball, he was absolutely right. There just doesn't seem to be enough time for a hitter's brain to process a 95 mile an hour fastball and react quickly enough to hit it. The distance from the rubber to home plate is 60 feet 6 inches. Subtracting 5 or 6 feet to account for the pitcher's stride, it takes a fastball traveling at 90 to 95 miles an hour about 400 milliseconds to get from the pitcher's hand to the catcher's mitt. The batter is already at a disadvantage because it takes the human brain around 80 to 100 milliseconds just to process the image that the eyes are taking in. On top of that, it's going to take 150 milliseconds on average to get his bat around to meet the ball and 25 milliseconds for his brain to send the signal to his body to swing. That leaves him with just 125 milliseconds to gauge the pitch and decide whether or not to go for it. To put this in perspective, it takes 300 to 400 milliseconds just to blink. If the pitch looks good, the batter has a 7 millisecond window to meet the ball in a position where he will put it in play. If he's too early or too late, the best he can hope for is a foul ball. So how is this humanly possible? Hitters begin predicting the trajectory of the ball based on the movement of the pitcher's arm before it even leaves his hand. This makes up for the fact that he won't actually see the pitch until it's a quarter of the way towards him. So you have to admit, hitting a major league fastball seems nothing short of super Well, maybe baseball is not your thing. Let me give you another example. We put these things up to our heads every day and talk to someone or FaceTime someone, but you can't tell me how it works. Or, or maybe you've got the concept down, but not really. I mean, no one says, I'm going to refuse to use these things until I understand how they work. No one does that. Why? Because we don't care. I mean, we don't care about understanding as long as it works. That's called believing the unexplainable because of the undeniable. This is important to realize because it's going to help you the next time that you're doubting your faith or possibly even talking to a friend who is struggling in believing in God. There's a great story in the Bible where Jesus deals with this very issue. It's in John chapter 9. Now, I I I'm more of a visual learner, so bear with me. Watch this little clip and it's going to set up our story. Master, who did sin? This man or his parents said he was born blind. Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Now up to this point, it's been an awesome story because the unexplainable has happened, especially if you're the blind guy or his parents who he's never seen before. I mean, talk about incredible, right? The blind guy wasn't thinking, wait a minute, I can't explain how you just healed me, Jesus. So, you know, he was just glad that he was healed. It's the same way we believe that the batter is able to hit a 90 to 100 mile fastball. That's fast. I know that because my nephew plays for the Cubs and he can throw that fast. It's really unexplainable or impossible that you could hit that type of ball that fast, but we don't refuse to watch baseball. I'm just excited when my team, the Giants, get more hits than the other team. Now the story really starts to pick up steam right about now. See, one of Jesus' missions was to help people see what God is like. 
So after Jesus heals this guy, news gets out to the Pharisees. Those are the religious leaders of that day. And they get all upset for a number of reasons, but they can't see the power of God for two main reasons. The first one is this. They couldn't explain it. In verse 10, the Pharisees haul this man in front of them and said, Who healed you? What happened? I mean, we want an explanation. Fair question. In verse 11, it says, He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go down to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I mean, you're saying he put some magic mud on your eyes? No, 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 no. I mean, you got to have something else. What's better than that? We're not, we're not buying the magic mud thing. See, we want an explanation. And then they ask him a really stupid question. They said, where is this man? He said, I don't know. I didn't see where he went. I mean, I added that little part, I didn't see where he went, because they're ta- they were talking to a blind guy at that moment, right? And they couldn't believe where he went. See, they refused to believe this guy because they couldn't explain it. Magic mud, what are you thinking? What are you talking about? The second reason that they couldn't believe is it didn't fit. The story didn't fit into their God box. In verse 16, the Pharisees come to the conclusion, they say, this man, talking about Jesus, can't be from God. The reason is because Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath, which was forbidden to work based on the law. So because Jesus did a work, he healed a guy, he can't be from God. That was their conclusion. Have you ever met someone who is legalistic? You know what I mean? You know, in fact, Jesus met a bunch of people like that, and he taught about the difference between the spirit of the law and the law so that you don't turn into someone who's legalistic. Well, Jesus taught about this in Matthew, that obeying the letter of the law is a matter of physical action, but obeying the spirit of the law requires more than just outward actions. It also involves an attitude of the mind and the heart. He taught things like, the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Remember, one of Jesus' missions was to show people what God was like. And in this situation, God is more concerned about giving the blind man sight than he is following the letter of the law. For them, it was unexplainable and inconceivable because it didn't fit into their God box. So what did they do? They tried to disprove it. Maybe this guy wasn't even blind, they're thinking. You know, let's talk to his parents. So if they can't disprove something, what do you do when you can't do that? You shift your strategy to discrediting or cause some doubt. I I was talking to a person last week, and they were ripping on a pastor who has a huge church, and they said, his preaching is just too uplifting, too positive. He only tries to make people feel good. I ask them, so you would rather a pastor's message be negative and discouraging? See, when things don't fit into our theological box, then I can't believe that it's from God. Even though the Pharisees couldn't explain it, it was undeniable fact that this blind guy could now see. Have you ever driven a car with a blind spot? Well, sure you are, because All cars have blind spots. The fact is, every car has a blind spot, like every person has blind spots. The problem is that if you drive your car without realizing the blind spots, you can end up damaging yourself or others. See, Jesus was trying to help these religious leaders see that their blind spot was hindering them from seeing spiritually, was hindering them from seeing what God is like, from seeing outside of their God box. You see, the key to dealing with blind spots in our life is to realize that we can have them and we need help to see them. The end of our story, we see the Pharisees totally frustrated with this whole thing, and so they throw this once blind man out. Jesus hears about what they did to this blind man, so he goes and finds him. Just like Jesus, right? He goes for the dejected, he goes for the outcast. And here's what that encounter looks like. (laughs) Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. 
Lord, I believe. A judgment I am come into this world that they which see not might see. And that they which see might be made blind. Are we blind also? If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, we see. Therefore your sin remaineth. So this brings us to our end of our story, and I want to bring it to an application of how this works in our life. My question is, what's the blind spots that's hindering you from believing in Jesus? Maybe hindering you from seeing Him in your life because of doubt or suffering? What's got your focus? What's got your attention? Maybe your blind spot is depression that's hindering your faith from seeing your future that God has for you. Maybe it's anxiety because you're stuck in your home. Maybe it's your never-ending bills that are stacking up. It's got you wondering, is God going to really help me in this recovery? Let me give you some encouraging words. God has not given up on you. Did you hear me? God has not given up on you. And He's just as committed to you now as He was when He sent His Son to die for you on the cross. There are hundreds of promises in the Bible where God declares His love and commitment to you. Check them out. There are two types of people in our story today. The blind man whose eyes were opened for the first time to see Jesus and then he believed, it says, and he worshipped Him. The other was the religious people that needed their eyes open because their God box was preventing them from seeing beyond what they couldn't explain but was undeniable. Which one are you? If you're the blind man, let me offer a step for you today that you could take. I'm just going to ask you to simply bow your head and, and let me lead you through a prayer that can help. The prayer doesn't make you a Christian. This prayer is just a way of expressing the faith that has been born in you, in your heart. Or maybe it's that you've been pondering this for a while. Here's what I'm asking you to pray. Bow your head and pray this. Heavenly Father, Thank you for allowing me to call you Father because your Son said I could. Thank you for sending your Son into this world to be my Savior. In this moment, I believe that Jesus paid for all my sin. I believe that He came to be my Savior. Help me to follow you and to get to know you more. Amen. Now, maybe you're like the religious people in this story. You, you've been to church, you go to church, you've, you know, you've been consistent maybe at going to church, and you've heard all the stories, but something has got a hold of you right now, and it's preventing you from seeing Jesus in your life, or possibly even experiencing His closeness it, to you. Something has got a hold of you. Something has got you down. Something has got you depressed or discouraged or feeling dejected. Let me give you a step today as well. It starts by surrendering and praying this. Jesus, I need you. My knowledge of you and my experience of you aren't lining up. You have done things in my life that are undeniable. And yet, I question and doubt. Thank you for not walking away from me. Thank you for being by my side. Even in the midst of my questions and doubts, Help me to see where I'm blind and to trust you where I come up short. Open my eyes so I can see you again in Jesus' name. Now, I hope that you found this message today encouraging and helpful. If you did, would you just leave a simple comment or press the like button so that I know that, that it connected with you? If, if you were the blind man or the religious person in the story today and prayed that prayer, let me know by simply emailing me at rick at hopepd.org. Just so that I know and I can be praying for you this week. It's been said that music speaks to our hearts. That's true. Our band is going to lead you in the next song. I raise a hallelujah. In the 
the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody Praise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me It's been great getting to worship with you today. Thanks so much for being part of the service. But we still have one more element of worship to do, and that's when we give back to God out of what God has given to us. Because when we give to God, not only is it an act of worship, what we are doing is we're demonstrating that we trust God with all of our lives, and we're also helping to extend the ministries of our church. There are three safe and secure ways that you can give. You can text your gift to 84321, or you can give online at our church website, hopepd.org. If you go there, you can give a one-time gift or you can give a recurring gift and set that up for week after week or month after month. And of course, you can always mail your gift to Hope Lutheran Church, 45900 Portola Avenue, Palm Desert, California, 92260. 
If you'd like to reach any of the church staff or if you need prayer, you can email any of us and all you have to do is send us an email at just our first name at hopepd.org. For example, mine would be gerald at hopepd.org. Now, before we go, remember, click the subscribe button, leave a comment. You'll help more people get to discover the hope and the love and the grace of Jesus. I really hope you can join us for our morning devotions Monday through Friday online on our church Facebook page. And uh, you can find all of our activities at hopepd.org. Have a great rest of your week.